You do not need a PhD to make a cup of coffee, but that is the kind of work that people can end up doing after university. A third of UK graduates are apparently overeducated with more qualifications than their job requires. What is that doing to them and to the economy? Welcome to Roundtable with me, David Foster. A call centre worker with a master's degree, a shop assistant with a doctorate. These might be extreme examples, but over-education, as it is called, is a growing issue in the UK and other countries around the world. Every year, millions of young people graduate from university hoping to find a good job. But what happens next? Millions of British workers are overqualified for their position, according to figures from the UK's Office for National Statistics. Britain's got talent, but much of it seems to be going to waste, with graduates stuck in jobs that don't require their level of education. The ONS says 31% of graduates were overeducated for the job they were doing in 2017. Graduates of the arts, biology and humanities are the most likely to be affected. And almost 30% of graduates are still considered overeducated five years after completing their first degree. Although overeducated employees earn a positive return on their salary, the pay boost is significantly lower compared with those who are matched to their jobs. Is overeducation an acceptable part of modern work, or could it harm the economy in the long term? Let us get talking then. Joining me at the round table today, Geraint Johns, former director of the Work Foundation, Demi Dimitropoulou, a graduate who worked as a coffee barista before beginning work in digital strategy. We have Francis Green with us too, professor of work and education economics at University College London, and John Boyes from the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development. Uh, take a look at them behind me. They are smiling, but they should be throwing their mortarboards up in the air. They should be deliriously happy, but a degree these days, John, start with you, and not necessarily a cause for celebration. A, a degree is a massive cause for celebration. They've worked very hard. They've got the qualifications. They, that is still your golden ticket to a career in many of the best professions, uh, to become a nurse, to become a lawyer, to become a doctor, to become a journalist. Now, here's the problem. It wasn't always the case. You did not always need a degree to become a journalist or to become a nurse or to become a police officer. So we find that uh, more and more uh, graduates are needing to get those qualifications that previously they didn't need. Now, the problem is they're very expensive, not just expensive uh, to the taxpayer, but but also to them as individuals. Uh, and that mismatch between uh, the qualifications and skills that, they're requi that are required in the job and the ones that they are required to get... But, but, but a degree is no guarantee of the job that you expected to get when you set out on that qualification. Why? Well, why should, uh, why should society guarantee people jobs? No, no, I said Absolutely. their expectations. Their expectations, it's true. Um, there's, there's always been some kind of over-education. It's not, it's not a new phenomenon. Uh, if you go back to the 1980s or the 1960s, there were people with degrees who didn't have grad, what we would call graduate jobs. The problem is that it's, the proportion has increased a lot. And we shouldn't be worried about some level of over-education, but we should be worried if it's incrementally increasing and increasing and increasing. Well, which which it is at the moment, which, isn't it? Which it is in a number of countries, not everywhere, uh, it's increasing in the UK, it's increasing in many countries in Southern Europe and in Eastern Europe, but you can go to uh, Germany, for example, where it's decreasing, or you can go to Scandinavia, where it's pretty well the same, has been for... Well, uh, for let us explore in a moment where years. those countries perhaps have so, got it right. You know, yeah. can, I, can I come to you in yeah. a minute, because well, I do want to hear a personal story from Demi, first of all, just to get the human side of this. Um, and, and you had to work as a barista. This was back, back, back in Greece. And even after you'd finished your degree over here, you found it tough, didn't you? It was pretty tough. It, uh, in fact, the fact that I couldn't find uh, a perspective of, uh, of a job in my sector was the deciding fa uh, factor. You, you studied fine arts and I you wanted to become arts. a curator or...? 
I had a, I had a plan um, of either becoming a curator or working on the academic side. But seeing the percentages and uh, talking with career advisors, I had to basically let go of that uh, hope. Did you get job interviews and then find yourself let down or, or, or did you not even get as far as the interviews? There were no interviews, there was... Um, so you can't tell me what their reaction was because you never got there? Absolutely not, they just told me uh, you should probably get an additional degree on curating or an additional degree uh, in uh, management or something like that yeah. if you want a career in arts. Gary, sorry I stopped you. Well, one of the things that we have to be careful about in talking about over-education is that over-education itself really is a very slippery concept. You know, what do you require in order to perform certain tasks? If you look at the area of accountancy, for example, go back 30, 40 years, people didn't need degrees in order to do that. But accounting was a very different thing. It amounted to bookkeeping largely. Now we have very complex financial instruments uh, people 40 years ago didn't need to know anything about the pricing of options or other derivatives. Now they do, and so more education is needed in order to do those jobs, and the accountants then bring more value to their firms as a result of this. In Demi's case, studying fine arts, uh, there is a difference in the value of different types of degree, and if you look at over-education, it does seem to concentrate among certain subjects. So if you look at some of the STEM subjects, maths, computing, for example, there's relatively little over-education, and people go on and use the skills. But it's the point. arts, isn't it? But if you look, it's not just the arts, it's some of the STEM subjects. Biology also has quite a lot of over-education, for example. But within the arts, there's the arts, humanities, media, particularly, have relatively high levels of over-education. Yeah. And I think what that really implies is that the information isn't necessarily getting through to school children about what subjects are most remunerative. You have a license to say whatever you would like, but I want to put this thought out there. 20 years ago, in this country, the then Prime Minister, Tony Blair, uh, said he thought it'd be a great idea if 50% of the country went to university, school leavers went to university. That was achieved roughly towards the end of last year. Now, my question, my thought out there is, were we selling people a dream or, or a nightmare? Oh, I don't, I don't think we were selling people a nightmare because the, the truth is that if you go back 20 or even more years, jobs do require much more skilled labour than... than I mean, there's lots of evidence that that's the case, uh, both directly measures of skills and people looking at the, the, the pay that on average you get when you do a degree. So just as the accountant's job has changed over the years, the manager's job... A manager now is hardly recognisable from what a manager would have been in the 1970s. Even, even the, the professional jobs that you mentioned, John, uh, uh, police, top police people and, 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 and nurses nowadays, uh, they're not doing the same job, the same task. They're doing a whole different complexity of tasks than they used to do. So there has been an upskilling of the jobs as well. And that's why over-education hasn't got out of control so <clears throat> far. That's my position. If you track the amount of over-education there is, it's gone up uh, incrementally and occasionally even gone down a little bit in Britain. But that doesn't mean to say that it won't get out of control, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Because so far, jobs have been upskilled. Okay, up so you, you're, but you're I, saying that people do need to have the education to do the more complicated jobs. Is that your personal feeling? That's not actually my personal experience because um, while my degree was in humanities, uh, well, uh, my job is uh, STEM. Uh, I, uh, I basically perform the tasks of a computer engineer without ever having stepped a foot inside a university that uh, teaches computing. I learned everything on yes. the job and that's uh, the yeah, majority see, of my colleagues. But, but this is it, isn't there, it? There I mean, are... do, do you have to go to university to learn these skills, or should employers be embracing the 21st century and helping people along that way? To, to, uh, well, jo John, because he hasn't had a chance for a One problem. possible problem is that there are not alternative pathways. So we often talk about building an apprenticeship system, uh, but that just hasn't come to fruition in the way that we would like it, to the point where young people can make 
you know, a reliable choice between the two options of apprenticeship here and university there. And that's going to take a bit of getting used to. That's going to take employers to get behind the system, to build up frameworks, something that uh, education of parents so that they're perhaps less snobby about the value of alternative pathways to education. I mean, Tony Blair sold this idea of 50% because... Uh, you know, university education is an aspiration. Many people talk about being the first in their family to go to university. And, but when we but, think but, about... But every biscuit tin technical college around the country is now called a university and people think they have a degree rather than a diploma. Now, I, I would probably challenge that a bit. I think that we have a, an incredibly strong higher education system. But what it has done is it has been very good at sort of appropriating public resource and money, whilst other sectors, for example, the further education sector and adult learning have kind of been underfunded over that time. Now, if we're talking about value for money, some of these might actually be much better routes. But young people don't have a choice because, you know, organisations don't recognise those qualifications in the same way as this creeping credentialism that allows them to say, no, nope, I want a 2-1 degree from a university. doesn't necessarily mean it's adding the value, that it's making people more productive, but it is just the standard that uh, they are accepting. Demi's experience, is, I think, is hugely instructive because she's ended up in a graduate position uh, without necessarily having had the training that you feel you required for that. And your life story seems to be one of mismatch. There's a mismatch between the skills that you've acquired through your education and the skills that you're expected to uh, participate in in work. And we call it over-education. I think we, we really need to look at the role of the labour market here and how well the labour market functions in matching people to jobs. And as Francis was saying earlier, there is some evidence that there's poorer matching going on now than maybe 10 years ago. That might account for the increase in perceived rates of over-education, but it would also account for a lot else that we're seeing, such as the productivity puzzle, the failure of productivity to rise at the kind of le level or rate that it's been rising at previously before the Great Recession. So we know that's a big problem for the economy. It's a problem for the labour market, it's a problem for the people trying to get jobs themselves, isn't it? So How do you solve this one? certainly a problem for the people trying to get jobs themselves. I mean, we know that graduates in non-graduate jobs, and by the way, they're not always just serving behind a coffee bar. They may be doing quite skilled jobs, but not, not graduate jobs. And they pretty well always show high levels of job dissatisfaction. Uh, and uh, they're pretty well always trying to move on, but only a proportion of them them do. I mean, I think Demi's, it is, Demi's it, done very well in moving <clears throat> on, but she's at, probably in a minority amongst people who start yeah. off in, in a sort of over-educated position. Because you get scarred. You get mm. scarred and your skills... Um, I, could, I would slightly I not... challenge what, what, what you said about, about the mismatching on subject, Sir Geraint, because I think one of the things you learn at university is how to learn and how to pick up skills. And so you might say, well, OK, so I've I've done this particular subject, whether it's arts or history or whatever, and you're not actually using the arts or the history in what you're doing at work. But you picked up some presentation skills. You think up, you picked up some some writing skills. You picked up some thinking skills, which actually you are using in your job. That's really important because yeah. one of the ways that over-education gets measured is just by asking people, uh, do you need what you learnt at university? in order to do this job. Oh, so we might not be and giving people, the, the true picture. Pe exactly. People forget that a lot of what they learn at university is these skills, these generic skills, communication skills, negotiation skills and so on, rather than yeah. learning about something that happened in history in 1614. Now, now, now you could do this in another way. Uh, you could have a fantastic apprenticeship system like you, you have, for example, in Germany, and that's why they don't have so many graduate jobs. They don't have so many graduates, far fewer than Britain. They have far fewer graduate jobs. So a graduate job is a job that is highly skilled that requires particular abilities that you will have learned yeah. perhaps through your apprenticeship. But if you have a great apprenticeship system, mm. then, uh, then you could go down that route. And probably Blair made the judgment, says, well, he looked, at, he looked at the apprenticeship system in Britain figured out, well, we don't have a great apprenticeship system, and, and that's possible. Perhaps you should have looked at fixing he, that. Well, uh, Demi, from a personal point of view, keep coming back to you from this, and but join the debate in, in any way that you would like, do you recognise what you've been hearing here about university perhaps equipping you 
for life, not necessarily a particular role, that it taught you how to socialise, it taught you how to learn, it taught, taught you how to analyse, to research, all of those things? Uh, from a personal viewpoint, my question is, are the tutors in university uh, supposed to know how to do presentations on the level uh, that an office environment requires? Mm -hmm. And are they able to transfer those skills? Because in my experience, that's not true. They know how to present something to the degree they would as a tutor in a university. But they, most of them necessarily have never stepped a foot inside an office. Uh, so I'm not quite so certain. But if that applies to 100% of students, everybody's in the same boat? Uh, yes, apart from the managerial and very yeah. kind of like uh, job industry oriented roles. Here's a thought. Graduates end up with, in the UK end up in debt to such an extraordinary degree mm. that perhaps they're happy to take underpaid jobs because that means until they reach a threshold they'll never have to pay back the money they borrowed. There is a bit of a danger there and uh, there is a review going on into higher education funding, uh, the OGO review, which is due to report any day now. But one of the characteristics of the student loan system in the UK is that debt gets written off after 30 years. And that means that there is a bit of a perverse incentive for students to go into areas that are not so remunerative because if they think, well, I'm never going to have to pay off my debt in full yeah. anyway. And if your debt is £60,000 yeah. or something like that, if, if you're earning just below the £25,000, I think it is, back. you don't pay anything back until you go above that. Yeah. So stay below it, wait 30 years because that level's always going to be changing. And there you go. The so this is, the is something that all of well, we, 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 we don't yet have the evidence that that's happening. And I have some, actually have some colleagues who are looking into that at the moment. But basically that generation that's paid that amount of fees and got that amount of debt hasn't yet got seriously to that, that stage yeah. when, when, when these employment decisions, even these, these other life decisions like whether to get married or not and whether to have children, are these likely to be affected by the debt and their, their situation in, in the labour market? This is a quote from an article I read in The Guardian. I won't, I won't read it all. In any other area, it would be called mis-selling. In this case, that include, these are the mis-sellers, some of the most eminent politicians in Britain, but we don't call it mis-selling. We refer to it instead as going to university. <laughs> <laughs> we've done a lot on the basis of averages, and, and we've heard about the rate of return to an investment in yeah. higher education. Good point. And we know that there's a decent average rate of return to that. You know, education is a good investment. But what we're learning more and more from new data that have become available, particularly the longitudinal educational outcomes data, is that there are big differences between different types of degree and also where you study for them. Yes. I might challenge the idea that there's still a premium associated with being a graduate and that stayed constant. Of course, if graduates are now doing jobs that were previously taken by people who aren't graduates, then there's a kind of bumping out. So you have people who previously didn't have a degree, uh, say, for example, the baristas, they are really struggling to get into those roles because now they're occupied by graduates. So because all of the salaries have kind of been bumped down. The differential between having a degree and not having one has stayed the same. So I want so to say it's a good investment. Of course, still that that's true. It is a good investment, but only because there's no viable so alternative. So you should still go out and buy it. You should still go out and buy it. It makes perfect economic sense to get that qualification because without it, bright young thing is not going to get into that. I mean, it's rather like buying a car without an engine, though, isn't it? Well, in that it doesn't. It actually doesn't work. contribute to yeah. your productivity. It works well, in so far as... It doesn't get you anywhere. We've well, also got 3.8% unemployment. I mean, I, I, it, it would take quite a lot to convince me about the idea of bumping in that context. It's, stu it's still the case that e even if you're not in a classical graduate job, it's still the case that people have more education, earn more on average, mm. than people who have less... Would you do education. it again? Uh, no. <laughs> I, I do think that it was just a placeholder for six years of my life because it was a degree in Greece and a degree in the uh, UK. Uh, during which I could have... Uh, I, all the projects I did parallel to that uh, was uh, what basically contributed towards uh, my career. So... Would you do a degree in computing? No. So what do you say to these three people here who all suggest that a university education is, if not essential, it, it's sort of, uh, it is an added value to your life and, and your career. So what do you say to that? I think there is, a, there is the subject of uh, personal maturity and uh, life in general. Uh, when you're 18, 
you will most likely not know what you want to become as a person. So there is definitely place and time where the options need to be tried and the person gets to try that to a certain degree on a foundation course, uh, doing A-levels, etc. But we shouldn't be afraid of apprenticeships. We shouldn't be afraid of uh, some kind of like technical college that just teaches you a skill if you have made up your mind. Why is it that the majority of those who are deemed to be overeducated in this country, and the number's gone up from 22% in 1992 to 34% of disorder, why is it that the majority of those thought to be overeducated are migrants? That's an interesting one, uh, and it, it shows also in the geographical spread of overeducation. So there's twice as much overeducation in London. In as here as in London, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that may well be because as migrants come over to the UK, employers are not confident about the educational qualifications that they have. They may not be confident about their skills in English, in dealing with other people, perhaps. And so it takes quite a while for migrants to shake down into the kind of jobs that their qualifications tell us they should be doing. But there is a huge unexploited resource for the country. You know, if we could harness all the skills that people have, not just migrants, but other people as well, mm. that are being underutilised, we could increase the GDP of, of the UK by a huge amount. But you could look at it from another point of view, which is that not, a, not, not that um, there's a massive resource there that's not being used, but that those people, these migrants that we're referring to here, have come here believing something that isn't actually the case, that they will be able to get a job because they got a degree in their home countries. Well, you might ask where that they've come from. After the 2007 financial crash, there were some eye-watering rates of youth unemployment in southern Europe. In countries like Greece and Italy, Spain, it reached up to 50%. That's half of young people sat there with a degree, twiddling their thumbs. So, so this looked like a really good place so to come like, to. Like Britain like... hadn't been that harmed, perhaps, other than austerity which followed. Britain hadn't been that hard. Therefore, it was the obvious place to go to. It was like a mother hen. But again, but it's it a shouldn't matter, have been. It's a matter of averages. They definitely had a better chance for coming here of getting a job, but it doesn't guarantee them. It doesn't, it doesn't give, give them all necessary jobs. Can I just say one other thing? I think another thing which you did, which was really good, was to go and get a master's degree. Am I right? And there does seem to be some evidence that people who've gone to, got to get master's degrees, it's those people who are doing better and better. Uh, in terms of the rates of return, at least, in the, in, the, in the labour market over the years, and that people who only do an undergraduate degree, the rate of return to that has stagnated at best or even it's gone... It's an arms but, but race. But where, where are we going to go with this? This is what I was just about to say. You know, uh, 45, 50 years ago, if you did your O-levels yeah, and then went on to do A-levels, you were considered to have got... Oh. The cream off the top of the... No, 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 I'm saying where does it go? Because you say, great to have a master's. Well, when one day a master's is going to be devalued, not worth very much, you're going to have to get a PhD, and after that you're going to have to get a professorship. Well, I, agree. Or what, or what... I agree. If, that, if that's the trend, then it's obviously a, a, bit, a big waste in that. But there is an extent to which people do a more sort of general undergraduate degree, pick up those kind of general skills, and sometimes do a then more specified... Uh, a bit more vocational degree in the area that they want to, to go into. They've grown a bit over those years. They've found that they've, they've grown themselves, found themselves a little bit more. So I think there is a strong case for master's degrees, but there's the, also the danger that you've got this credentialism, oh, I didn't have a job, so I might as well go and get a, a master's degree. And we need to... We, we need to have a nuanced response to this. You know, sometimes it's mm. going to be beneficial and other times it's not. Isn't this just life? You know, you, you, you do the best you can getting a degree, you try the best you can to get a job, and it doesn't always work out. Yes. yes. Well, if we look at the probability that it'll work out, the probability that it'll work out is much higher if you do have a degree. So um, if you looked at the rates of graduate underemployment, when people are newly graduated, it's relatively high. If you look again after five years, it starts to creep down. So young people tend to switch jobs a bit more often. Sometimes it takes a little bit more time just for the economy to sort them into the place that they're most productive. So although graduate overqualification is a problem, it does tend to peter out over time. Debbie, I, I want to come to you because we're running out of time. We, we've got to wrap it up very, very quickly. The job you have now, yeah. is it a job that you would have been satisfied with and happy with if you'd started out thinking, well, one day I will have a career, but I don't know quite what it is? In other words, have you got where you wanted perhaps 
not through the path that you would have thought? Uh, yeah, I, I believe that um, even I, I, I knew because of my interests and my computer relationship with computers that I would eventually be able to have a career in computer uh, related uh, things anyways but I wouldn't have gone through this whole merry-go-round of uh, going to universities trying but to perhaps that was necessary to get you where you were but by a circuit circuitous route the one thing I would say is that there is a tremendous marketing campaign from universities, especially targeting uh, South uh, European and other countries, in which they don't necessarily guarantee a, a job, but they more or less do. So there, there is a, a part of that as well when it comes to universities as marketing. So we come back to this idea that I mentioned uh, from the Guardian writer that it is a case of mis-selling. There, there are those universities that would be straight down the line and there are those that are just trying to rake in the money and the students. Certainly, it, it, secondary school students need better information on which to base their decisions, like, particularly about which subjects to take and which careers to aspire to. You know, I'm sorry, there aren't many curators about. OK, uh, that's it. Put your pen and paper down. The term is over. We will see you next time for another edition of Roundtable. Thank you for watching. Thank you for coming on the programme. Goodbye for now.